Let's go ahead and create our security group for our Elastic file system. If you type security group, you will not most probably get a service or anything because the reason for that is uh, we don't have a set, uh, dashboard for security group instead it will be under vpcs if you search for vpcs you will get a result and then if you click on vpc you will be able to go to a dashboard where you can change your security group firewalls ip addresses and all those things so this is the vpc dashboard and it's a nice summary of what you have configured it is think of it as a software defined network for your or data center for your amazon account for each region that you see, whether it is Virginia, it gives a summary of what is happening in your account, how many VPCs are there. These are all the default configurations, guys, by the way. I have not done anything, I have not touched anything here. These are absolutely as it is, as Amazon provides. If you log into your account and if you go to your dashboard in the top that you can see here, if you click on the dashboard, you will get here. And here what I'm going to do is just choose a security group, click um, create new security group always the new uh, anything that you do uh, want to do is on the right uh, very top it will be a big blue button usually I'm just going to say the name of the security group is going to be Galaxy EFS demo and it's always a good practice to give a decent name um, I use this convention it is not necessary that you have to do the same thing you're absolutely welcome to give whatever you want and since I don't have any other VPC, it's showing up or it is listing my default VPC. I'm just going to leave it as it is. Click on create. And you can see here, this is the one that I have created. And the one that is, as you can see here, the group name is default. It is Amazon created. Do not try to delete this or modify this because sometimes you are the most need your security group and don't try to delete this one or modify this one leave it as it is and let me click on that and these are the inbound rules that is i'm allowing who wants to access my um, uh, services or resources residing inside this security group that is think of it as a, a compound wall around your house so you are going to define who is going to come inside now that is inbound or ingress it can be called in any words in inbound is some uh, thing amazon uses ingress is sometimes uh, the question paper or the uh, interviewer or outside world calls it so i'm just going to choose all tcp ip traffic which is originating and destination uh, originating from my security group itself is allowed so you can see that sg96 where did i get this name it is here from here you can see that is my group id for my security group so all traffic which is coming from source of this one is allowed. I'm going to allow it now. I'm going to save this. And if you notice, I I need to do an SSH or RDP. So I'm going to allow SSH also so that I can connect to my servers. And uh, since I don't know my current IP, I can give my exact IP, but uh, I don't want to restrict it if I want to reboot or anything. So I'm going to give this right now and i repeat myself this is not a secure way of doing things in enterprise you will have a bastion host or a jump host or a ssh server depending upon the company's naming terminology you will have something and that server's ip will be given here so technically you log into that server and connect to your target machines so that is done i'm just going to check my outbound rules so everybody has come inside I'm going to see if everybody is allowed to go outside. So you can see here, all traffic, all, all, and destination is allowed to the internet. So anybody who comes inside is allowed to go outside, in other words. So that is all we have done here. I'm just going to leave it as it is. Go to my Elastic file system. Okay, it has logged me out. Let me re-log in. Okay, click on create file system. It is refreshed.
okay it's still refreshing for you guys okay you see here the vpc here there is a default one only so i'm going to choose the default one but if you come down here let me choose only like yesterday um, three subnets or three availability zones a b c only so let me remove all these things and this is the place where we want to give the uh, Galaxy EFS demo security group. I don't want this default security group because I don't want uh, my servers and uh, EFS to be in different places. So I'm going to remove this one and add only my uh, Galaxy EFS demo security group. So remove these two things, add only the ones that I created. So my EFS is going to be created with these rules that has been mentioned here. Go ahead and click on next step. Okay, I'm going to move this uh, control panel somewhere here. Okay, in the next step, let us go ahead and click on name and then give our uh, usual demo tag and then click on next step. So it is confirming everything. So this is my subnets. ABC and then this is my security group also So when you are creating our servers, we need to put our servers also into the same security group. So let us do that next Create click on create file system Okay, it is getting created and um, If you scroll down, this is where you check the status of the file system let me scroll down you can see here life cycle state and it still says creating so it will be ready or available or the state will change that is when you can start mounting it or having access to the file system that is a little confusing here you can see here life cycle state for the file system is here it says available and here it says creating let me go ahead and hit refresh Okay, this is the okay. file system is available. The mount targets are getting created. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense Meaning Amazon is trying to create the necessary network layer underlying network layer so that it is available on these three Availability zones that is 1c 1a and 1b So they are still working on that whereas the data and the storage necessary for this file system is already available now let's meanwhile go ahead and create our servers where we will consume this file system or mount these file systems and remember what the instructions to mount it it is here if you click on this the instructions will pop up oh it's terribly slow okay let me do that again you can see here uh, let me i just close it that's here this is the place I'm talking about Amazon easy to mount instructions if you click on that uh, you will get the mount instructions usually so meanwhile I'm just going to uh, reuse this window the VPC dashboard I don't want to open another one go to EC2 in North Virginia only ensure you're in the same region As of now, there are. Uh, this is the dashboards. Like all the services will have a dashboard in Amazon to give you a quick overview of what is happening in your account. You can notice it. As of now, I don't have any running instances right now, so I'm just going to click on launch instance. I'm going to start three instances, one in each availability zone. default just click on default here i'm just going to ensure it is in 1a us east 1a and click on next um, security group yeah automatically it will apply click on next to tag it i'm going to say this one this guy is 1a copy this Configure security group next step. This is where we need to carefully choose our security group I'm going to select the existing security group option and then we are going to choose the one which said Galaxy EFS demo security group and Ensure that all traffic is allowed and the source is the same and if it is SSH 
let it come from outside world also so click on review and launch and you just review it go ahead launch it i'm going to use my existing key since we saw already how to generate keys and use our keys so i'm going to use an existing key and launch instance and we are going to repeat this two more times now for availability 1b and 1c so the easiest way is the way i do is let it get refreshed so if you have an instance and you would like to launch many instances like that go ahead and select that instance and go to actions and you will have an option like launch more like this and it will give you a summary of all the configurations about that instance and whichever uh, configuration that you want to change you can change only that in my case i just want the availability zone to be different so i'm going to click on edit instance details and click on my availability zone to be in 1b so click on review and launch again we will come back come to the last page and then edit the tag as well so that it shows as 1b review and launch again launch choose my keys and then click on launch instance so we have we have launched two instances 1a and 1b let us go ahead and do the last one also quickly just want to confirm that I chose 1C only yeah great so we have three guys 1A 1B and 1C so I'm going to log into all of them now so I'm connecting taking the public IP Remember that you can only connect to the servers using the public IP and I'm just going to go to my console um, Edit this guy Put my public IP address Ensure my username is correct And I'm going to say this guy is One A guy And then just ensure that I'm using the Virginia key Click OK Double click we should be getting connected anytime okay I'm going to connect to 1b now let's go ahead and get the 1b IP address that is public IP address did I not choose a public IP address for this guy I think I did not choose the public IP address for these two guys Okay, the only way we can attach a public IP address is to stop and start them. My bad, always I do this. Okay, there's one may, one more way to attach a public IP to a guy. Oh, you're going to see more things now. You see on the left hand side, elastic IPs. I'm going to click on that. Okay, allocate new address, allocate. So I got a new public IP address. I'm going to attach it to our 1B guy now associate address and it is going to say <clears throat> give me my instance details I'm going to give it to 1B and going to click on associate close and we need one more for our 1C instance as well. I'm going to click on associate and choose my 1c associate okay great we have two public IP addresses and associated them with our instances let us go back to our dashboard now ec2 instances okay let me click on 1b you will have a new shiny new public IP address use that go here put it here easy to user bookmark settings i want to name this as 1b and then choose my key yep 
Now it is connecting. Come on, yep. Okay, one more session for 1C. Let me just do this one first, 1C. I'm just doing it little reverse way, but still it's the details are the same. We just need the IP address from here now. Okay, we have three servers and our mount point is also ready. It is, let us go and check the status of that guy and let us go ahead and run it. Um, I mean, I'm going to do something crazy, but uh, don't try this uh, when you are uh, in a production system. To save time and my typing effort, I'm going to execute the commands in all three of them at the same time because I'm going to execute the same commands right now. So it's easy for me to do that. So I'm going to root, go into root. And I'm going to check whether my EFS file system is ready first. Okay, I'm just in my EFS dashboard and it looks like it's still saying as creating. I'm just going to hit refresh and see what is the status. Okay, voila. So we have an available state here, as you can see um, in the bottom, if you can see the uh, lifecycle state has changed uh, from creating to available. So all we have to do is follow this mount, mount instructions that is given here. Since I'm already click on that um, link, it will give you the mount instructions. <clears throat> and we are going to copy paste the commands. We are using the dot Linux and we are already in root. So I'm leaving the pseudo part, go to my console, paste it, press enter, uh, multi execute paste is not working, okay, I should have used this option, anyway it should get completed anytime now. One of the guys is stuck. The first guy is still stuck and he's trying to do something. Okay, we let, let it get completed. I mean, if it is that is not working, that means that, okay, he's having internet problems. Great. <clears throat> System check completed, transaction succeeded, it is installing. Let me meanwhile go ahead and copy the command to create my mount target which is nothing but a simple command, make directory space EFS. Just going to, okay, all of those guys have come and I'm going to do a multi-paste, press enter. We have created our mount target and then the most important command here. I'm just going to copy paste it in a notepad. So we have a single command and ensure that it is all copied nicely. <clears throat> and I'm going to go back to my console multi-paste and press enter if it is hanging it is not working but it is not hanging so good so if i do a df-h in all of them we should be able to i'm going to exit exit multi-execute mode so it is visible cleanly df-h let us move this guy here oh, that is also still blocking the view Okay, you can see here there is a new file system called Amazon and then it is mounted in the root file system and you can see the size of it is something like 8 exabytes. So that is what Amazon says that you can grow up to the size of exabytes. I will do the same thing here as well, df-h and you'll see the file system. Let me go into the file system itself now and uh, do an ls-l. In other words, I'm listing the directories as of now, nothing is available. And remember that this file system is a common to all the three servers and as of now there is no files here so I'm going to go to 1c and create a file I'm going to say touch EF Galaxy EFS demo that's it 
So if you go here and do a ls l, you should be able to see the file immediately. In other words, you see here, I am in a different availability zone that is in 1C and I created a file, just a simple file, very simple one. And I was able to immediately see the changes on in another availability zone in 1B. You can do the same thing here as well. If you just go to slash root EFS and then create <coughs> make a new test file. I forgot the file name. Let us pick up the file name. It's going to be a little tricky for me because I have created a file with spaces. So if I go here and open this file, if you remember here, we did not create anything inside the text. So, but if I want to open the file, you will see that content is also replicated across regions um, in a very sh small latency. We have created a very, very small file, so it got replicated very fast, but I'm sure that this replication happens or the files will be accessible almost uh, without any delay across regions. So this is how an EFS works in production as well. Only that you will have additional security. That is, uh, we created only one security group and typically what happens in a production deployment is you will create one security group exclusively for EFS and everybody who is connecting to EFS will be in other security groups. So it might be your database layer, it might be your application layer or your partner systems in some other VPC and the security groups you will, ex you will allow only certain people using your inbound rules that we saw or modified some time back. So, so far as anybody has any questions or queries on how to set up an EFS, I am happy to answer them. So what we are going to see now is something called um, um, S3 analytics, storage class analytics. I'm just logging into my S3 console seems to have, have logged out. I'm going to use a uh, little older bucket because it has a lot of files and some analysis has happened on that bucket and we might be able to uh, show better graphs there. So I'm just going to use my S3 demo access logs bucket. I mean, uh, you can also do this in your account only that you need to have a lot of files and uh, give Amazon some time to process the files to give you the dashboard. So go to management, open the bucket, go to management and click on after management, click on analytics. Uh, you can see here I have two life cycle rules to clean up my bucket. One is for cleaning up my access logs. I'm moving it to Amazon Glacier and then I'm making it a permanent delete also possible. So configure this if you don't want to have a lot of costs associated, especially if you have a lot of activity happening in your account. So click on analytics. That is what I wanted to show here. And analytics typically shows a storage class analysis. In other words, it will show you how much of storage that you are using in Glacier, how much of storage you're using in standard and how much you are using in reduced redundancy. Uh, I don't have a lot of files, but you can see here a total of uh, half a MB is here. And then another half an MB is here about uh, 200 KB is here. So it just gives you a nice chart view of what is happening in your account and how much files you have. See, for example, on the 21st of July, I had about 15 KB of files and then um, I set up some new rules to clean it up automatically. And within a couple of days, uh, it got cleaned up. So typically this is like two days and the rule got kicked in and then it constantly kept cleaning automatically. And, uh, and by the way, I'm not doing the cleanup manually. It is all life cycle rules that I showed you some time back and it automatically removes the older files and it removes some more older files. And finally, we are here with, uh, we are in 27th of uh, July and I'm still continuing with the same number of files. So my delete also will kick in, but it will kick in after a month or so as I configured. So here is, as you can, if you can put your mouse here, it will show you whether I have added new files 
where, where am I storing and all those things. The reason I'm showing this to you guys is in my account or your demo account, this might not be useful. This might not be really relevant, but when you're talking about a company where they are storing a lot of data, millions and millions of files, and the storage will be huge and there might be easy optimizations here cost savings available to your clients so it might be very easy for you to just go to this dashboard and tell them see for example you are in storage uh, in standard if we move to glacier this much of cost savings is there A very simple nice and easy uh, low hanging fruit you can call it assuming that they have not done it if they have done it good then you need to spend more time analyzing the state of storage and see what kind of lifecycle policies you can introduce. So you have this uh, drop down options to see how much you are storing and how much you are using. As you can see in Glacier, I'm using close to about a half an MB, whereas in standard, I was using only about 156 KB something. So choose all these options, use them appropriately and then recommend to your clients. There is one more thing that you should notice here. You can have filters. In other words, you if you want to analyze only your access logs or if you want to analyze only your um, CloudFront logs, you can have a combination of those filters, especially if you have tagged them, you can filter them based on those tags. Remember, one of the reasons I keep saying tag them, tag them, because quite a lot of time the filters work on tags that are being used. So using those tags, you'll be able to filter only for certain amount of logs or data and then analyze them. It's a quick way of restricting the amount of data you are analyzing. So that is about analytics part, especially in S3. Let me go to metrics. I'm not sure whether I have any metrics in my account. Let me just check. If it is not there, we will go to another account to see the metrics. Okay, we have something here, great. So you can see here, it, uh, it shows how, many, how much of uh, bucket size bytes are there and I had about 14 KB on that day and automatically I have come down to four and then 706 KBs. Uh, so again, once again, these numbers might be small, just instead of thinking of a KB, think of it like terabytes or gigabytes. It shows you how you can use lifecycle policies to reduce your uh, cost by using is creating a simple rule and at any point of time, it shows you how much data you are consuming in your bucket. It's a summary of all the things. I have created a filter here, which picks up everything. I have not added any specific filter, as you can notice. Uh, what you can do is you can have more filters, complicated the scenarios, so you know the storage used by a particular uh, service, say, for example, CloudFront, or if you have created a static website, you want to see how much of the content is uh, used for storing static com content then you can choose that also. And you can see here there is in the top, there is a data transfer uh, and a request. These two are paid services. As you can see here, the bucket filter is selected, but paid metrics, paid metrics have not been enabled. So on the left hand side, you see here these two options are there. If I check them and then click on save, my paid metrics will enable and I will see data here. Mostly once again, companies will have uh, paid for this if they want to analyze it inside S3 itself and then they will be able to give you another nice graph on what is happening. So for now, you just need to know these options are available to analyze the data which is stored in S3. In other words, you are trying to optimize your S3 cost. That is all it is. And finally, inventory. Inventory gives you a list of uh, items that is in your account. If you click on add new, you can see I don't have anything right now click on add new and it's asking me what is the name of the inventory I want filters, which bucket I want to store it and what is the frequency I want the inventory. It, nothing but it will list all the items in your bucket. It might be 10 files, it might be 20 files or a million files. Amazon will take a list of all those things and put it in another bucket for you. And it is asking you what are all the details you want. You want the size, you want the modified date, what is the storage class, is there any other tags and is it a multi-part upload, is, what is the replication status and all those things. So another way to analyze what data is there and in the previous field we saw how much data is there that is the usage that is in megabytes or gigabytes. So using this data you should be able to have a very good picture of what is in your account and how to control the cost for that account 
or S3 bucket in other words. So this is one thing I wanted to show. So this is a new service that Amazon is slowly popularizing everywhere. It is for analyzing images that you have stored in your account or you can upload it to this service so that Amazon can recognize it. You can search an image, you can identify what is inside that image or you can tag that image with uh, objects inside that image. A lot of things are possible. I can show you a quick demo on how this works. I'm just going to click on this try Amazon recognition. Let me see if it logs into my account automatically. Yeah, it's working. And as usual, you can see here, the service is not available in all the regions and they have listed the three regions it is available. So once again, let us go to Virginia. And to my knowledge, this is not a free service. This is a paid service. Uh, there is a cost associated uh, with this uh, service, uh, whether you do uh, image search, that is object search or image moderation, facial analysis, or if you want to do anything, there is a small cost associated with it. Say, for example, the first one million request that you do is about $1. Um, if you want to spend $1 to learn the school stuff, go ahead and do that. Uh, I have started already using it, so I'm going to continue showing a demo because uh, if the cost is going to be there, let me use at least a million then. So let us click on the first one, object and scene detection. Amazon has already preloaded some images. Let us try to customize them later. You can see here there is an image. Um, is it loading? I'll just wait for you guys for, to, for it to load. You can see here there's a skater on the street, on the middle of the street, and then if you just go, uh, Amazon has already analyzed it and it says that uh, it has recognized a skateboard, a sport, a people, a person, human, and a parking. What we are going to do is go to Google and pick up some image uh, with uh, outdoor and landscapes, and we'll try to use that. We'll just copy that URL and paste it here. That's all you have to do. So let us go to Google and pick up an URL to do our scanning. I'm going to take this is one image and this one is another image. So let us do the first one now and go to recognition and ask it to scan that. So click on I'm going to recognition page. There's a bottom where you can fill in the URL. Are you guys still in the okay surprising it is refreshing very very slow okay this is where the page I am seeing click on go now okay it gives an error I don't know why just going to put it in a notepad um, the URL is either invalid or the server does not report. Okay, what we can do is just save this image locally. In the desktop, I'm going to say it as image one. And save the other image as image two. Go to recognition, click on upload, and then go to desktop, go to image one, upload happens. Okay, all I'm doing is uploading guys. 50% uploaded in my screen. It is good that while it is waiting, you should be able to see it uh, ready. Okay. I already have the results on my screen. Uh, you can see here, it has recognized people. It has recognized the humans. It has recognized bicycles bikes and cyclists so and if you want to more know more if you scroll down you can see here it has recognized a lot of other things i'm not sure where it sees a motorcycle probably it guesses that these cycles are motorcycle and all those things but you can see the confidence of whether it is a motorcycle or not is only 56 percentage whereas uh, when it says there's a cyclist it has a confidence of about uh, 92 percentage so let us upload our other image that is image two. 
which had only people and uh, crossing pedestrian crossing let us see if it can recognize a pedestrian crossing yeah let it refresh for you guys as well see here it says pedestrian crossing or zebra crossing is there for about 90 percent uh, 98 percentage confidence is there on that image and you can see here it recognizes the clothing patterns and intersection architecture downtown plaza town square in other words it is the town square where a lot of other uh, crossing happens so that is how an image recognition or, or object recognition happens whereas uh, if you want to do a uh, celebrity recognition that is also possible if you upload an image of a celebrity most probably it should work and here we have two images in the bottom one is jeff bezos uh, if you didn't know already this is the guy who owns amazon your amazon.com aws everything is owned by this guy he's the ceo so it automatically recognizes it and says a matching confidence of 100 percentage and if i'm not wrong this person is the one uh, cio or ceo of aws services and andy jesse uh, you can google that we can try another experiment uh, by using an indian celebrity let us say for example let us see if he is recognized i'm just going to take a clean image of this fellow uh, which one is good quality i don't know but anyway, I need an image. I don't want to spend much time here. It probably will recognize him as a person, but let us try it out. Awesome. It did work, guys. It did work. I just put the URL there, and you can see on the right hand side. Uh, it picks the exact name of uh, APJ Abdul Kalam. Uh, for people who didn't know, he was the president of India, a scientist uh, who helped us to send a rocket to the moon. Anyway, that is all I wanted to show here. And if you want to do image moderation, that is also possible. Say, for example, uh, you have uh, content which is uh, not suitable for all audiences and you want to moderate that content then that is also possible. You upload a, a image that needs to be moderated. Then you ask Amazon to guess it. Then Amazon will say that this um, image is, uh, should be moderated or this image should not be moderated. So all those things are possible and you have facial analysis. And if you do this, it will identify whether a person is smiling, whether the person is uh, having a glasses, they have a mustache, all those kind of things. So it gives a very good guess of a person's age as well. Uh, if you want to play around it with your friends, if you want to create your own service for reading from Instagram and trying to say, what is your friend's age? Go ahead and write an app for that. That is also possible using this service. So this is the other thing that I wanted to show you here. Amazon has a very cool uh, facial recognition algorithm as a service. You don't have to write the algorithm. All you have to do is upload that image and when you go here uh, there's a request and response on the right hand side all you have to do is process this response that is a json file in your application this is the response file you can see face details average age high low whether beard what is the confidence level value equal to false all those things so if you want to go ahead and create the next Instagram app with face recognition and uh, a celebrity matching go ahead and do that So because celebrity matching is going to be very very easy uh, You can easily do a face comparison and the celebrity recognition and see What is the nearest celebrity you are close to and find a matching confidence to which power person you want? Uh, say for example this celebrity or 80 percentage close and show it to them in the in your app That is quite easy and possible nowadays